Well, I'm back finally. Uh, kind of a weird couple of days when I got back because the weather was actually colder here in Austin, I think, than it was the last day in Seattle. So that was kind of funny. Um, but I thought I'd give you a quick update on travels and the kind of the plan for the next couple of uh, weeks. So, got my, got my lock and load t shirt. How's that, huh? Finally, uh, Finally got something uh, that I can wear from them for free, and then it's all free advertising, right? It's going to be awesome. So anyway, uh, let's see. The con was really interesting in that this was the first time I'd gone with a, a real plan, or well, the second time I've ever been to a con, but went to a con with the plan being not just to go and game with uh, friends, but to actually try and play games that I thought I didn't like or had discarded or dismissed in the past, as well as run the little lock and load tournament that was going on there. So uh, that was uh, that was all fun. You know, there was only, I think, eight of us or nine of us that actually played in the tournament, but we had uh, another 20 or so people come through and play some of the, the playtest games. So uh, that was fun. Uh, so the, that was cool. So the games that I played that I'd not tried before uh, were uh, Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. And uh, Gene, one of the, the guys there, excuse me, took me through uh, the strategy for the game. And you know, in fact, I've got it set up here. Which probably tells you I enjoyed it, right? Uh, we're talking about the strategy uh, for both sides and some of the, the things to consider. And just seeing uh, the first two or three turns played really changed my view on the on the game from the perspective that I, with card driven games I seem to have a hard time understanding although the, what the victory I may know what the victory conditions are how to achieve those and when to try and achieve those is a, often a challenge for me and I had the same experience with Helene's when uh, I set up one of the little scenarios a little Sicilian scenario or something like that and uh, I played a couple of turns of it and then posted some questions and guy goes, well, you know, you should be doing this, duh, everyone knows that. And I was like, well, how would I know that? How would I even strategically, with a plan or no plan, work that out? Anyway, with this game, because you have uh, cards, the cards are going to drive a lot of your activities and a lot of your choices. And... You know, my first reaction to that is, well, it's going to be a bunch of historical cards that are going to come out of order, and it's not going to be all linear history. But the way the types of cards that are in here are, uh, generally speaking, generic enough that they uh, they don't kind of ruin the, the historicity of the, of the game, if that's such a word. So, uh, you can try all sorts of different strategies and tactics, while you're playing this game. So I got very excited about the long, the short version of this long story as I'm crapping on about this game is that um, I think I'm gonna like it. Uh, playing the battles is real fun because you use these uh, these little cards and depending on what, how many troops you have and how good your leader is and the terrain you're in and all these sorts of things, uh, you receive a certain number of cards and clearly the more cards you have, the better position you're in to uh, kind of deal cards that match. It's basically a matching, a pairing game or a matching game when you when you come down to it for the battles. Uh, which card you play first matters or, or might not matter depending on uh, uh, how many cards the other guy has. And there are obviously only a certain amount of a certain type of card. Uh, double envelopment, for example, is only four of those in the deck. Uh, so, and there are blank cards, you know, like a joker that you can make them whatever you want them to be. I think they're called reserve cards. Anyway, so I had quite a bit of fun with that, and I enjoyed it, and I think that's kind of revised my opinion. I've taken off my trade bait list and put it on to my to-be-played list. I don't really have that list, but it's in. It's up here. And the other thing that I played that was really, really interesting was Combat Commander. I recently just sold off everything and saw that there was this... Uh, tournament and thought, well, you know, now's a great time to experience playing face to face now that I've sold everything. Uh, so I played, uh, played four games, ended up being uh, four games. And uh, in order for me to play, I really had to sign up for the tournament. And I told the guys, hey, look, I really just want to play one game. So I'll probably get beaten the first game. And then we can, you know, say bygones and I'll be out. And that's great. So 
we played the first game and it all went great and uh, had a great time. A great teacher. The guy was very helpful. I've played before by myself, so I kind of knew what was going on. But you don't. A lot of the cards you don't know how to use them efficiently or effectively, and of course every scenario is different. So played the first game. Kind of gave this guy a bit of an ass smack, and it was kind of fun actually. Um, and uh, and had a lot of fun playing that game. <laughs> Uh, it was very, very tense because uh, I really thought I was going to get just a massive beatdown. Uh, even def we were defending uh, a section of the Arnhem town uh, against the German counterattack. So we had defense on our side, meaning we were going to get uh, victory points every uh, every turn. But uh, he was uh, coming for me. So uh, played that second game. Played did I win that one. Lost that one. And that was a really tight game. Very interesting uh, scenario because it was uh, set in fog. And uh, I should have... I, so I learned a lot of things in the game. Uh, things that I would perhaps... They should be kind of core fundamentals from a tactical standpoint that you probably should have known as a game tactical game player. Uh, you should have you know, taken advantage of the lack of vision and, and strove to uh, get your units off the map uh, as fast as possible. Uh, second thing was that uh, uh, I also learned that once you once you earn a chunk of victory points, you've got to stop yourself and then ease off, take the foot off the gas, and then just sit back and let the other guy try and come back at you. Uh, and um, I learned that lesson in the third game we played, which I played with the tournament director, and uh, he and I played each other. And it was one of those, uh, it was a brutal scenario where this dude had um, a big heavy MG up on top of a hill that had a view of everything except for this little blind spot. And uh, my job was really to kind of get off the map and capture bits and pieces, but the only way to make uh, a lot of points was to get units off the map and then they cycle back on. And he left this gap right through the middle of the map that was, it was also a blind spot. And I was like, wow. He's setting me up here, and I'm going to get screwed. So let's just go for it anyway, and let's see. Let's enjoy the experience. Well, I managed to get through all that. One just barely won that game because I got a whole bunch of guys off. His MG jammed just as my guys were running through the clear terrain. So I scooted off a whole bunch of guys. I was up 21 victory points and just killing it. And I brought all my guys back on, and his gun was still jammed. So I was like, "Oh well, let's go again." So I started going again. His gun cleared. It was ugly. So he's just this massive dead Americans on the field. Uh, in the fourth game, we played this uh, Finns versus Soviets, and I didn't read the rules properly, and my fault, and got my ass kicked in the, in the, in the very final game. So that was fun. Good time. So I think uh, if I can pick up a copy of uh, a new copy of the second edition, and maybe some of the expansions for Europe, I think I will do that. Not particularly interested in the resistance side of it, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, so that's just if anyone's selling stuff, uh, any of their old stuff they want to get rid of, they're not into uh, Combat Commander anymore, let me know. So there was that. Played uh, quite a bit of OCS, and one thing I learned from that is that even some of the guys who've been around for a long time still make uh, lots of you know mistakes and uh, lots of tactical uh, mistakes and lots of rule mistakes that are all little things. Um, and they forget to you know move SP because it, or forget to put trucks, keep guys in supply, or whatever the case may be. So it made me feel a little bit better about uh, my gameplay, which was good. I was really there more to observe than to play. I got to play one or two turns uh, as the allies, and uh, kind of had a, a few little disagreements over how we should handle things, but that's fine, whatever. And. Uh, and then I think, and I, then I was just kind of blown away by the style of play too. So I, I was very like, wow, okay, why are you doing that? And I was really curious about how these guys were playing. So it gave me a new, a fresh insight, seeing three different players with three different styles playing the game and their approach to, uh, uh, to the game. So that was really, really cool. So I got a lot out of that. Lots of World at War, lots of Lock and Load, did some playtesting for Heroes of the Pacific, saw the uh, production copies of uh, Heart of Darkness and Nuclear Winter 68 and Anzac Attack and Forgotten Heroes, and they all look just super duper fine. Uh, I'll be reinstating my orders for Anzac Attack. Uh, and 
let's see what else. Sales of Glory was on the table. Played uh, uh, a little bit of that. Was not impressed. Uh, seems like a lot of futzing around for very little historical value. So I'm not a big fan of that. I don't really like any of the Wings of Glory stuff. I like the planes. I like the Wings of Glory system. Uh, but all the rest of it, all the like X-Wing and Star Trek and all that, it's just so far from being anything that anything related to the topic it's all the same shit with just different models and uh, I think there was an opportunity with Sales of Glory to do something really really cool but I think they missed it and uh, I'll be interested to see what the fans do with it because if you've spent $300 on this stuff I imagine you'd be wanting to try and make something more of the game um, than perhaps is there and we play with the advanced rules by the way uh, mo most of them anyway I think and uh and then my reading afterwards, because I was trying to work out what I was missing, I wasn't digging it at all. Now, one thing we did do that was fun, and it's lock and load, so watch out, Marshall Wilson, uh, was we uh, took the ASL model of uh, playing a Heroes game, and everyone had 10 people, and we all had a hero, and we put them on the map, and we had uh, recuperation stations or aid stations where you could uh, heal. That cost you a shot of uh, some sort of alcohol. And we had weapon stations as well, so you grab weapons and shoot. So we had flamethrowers and MGs and all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, you got to pick your hero and you all played random activation. Uh, lots of malaise, lots of shooting and lots of fighting. And it all came down in the very end. There were ten of us that came down to two guys. And uh, they uh, uh, rolled off against each other and basically killed each other. So it was a classic ending to, uh, to a, a very fun uh, stand-up-and-play kind of uh, drinking game. Because, uh, you know, we're all 40, 50 years old and we need a reason to drink. Um, I'm trying to think what else that I actually... Uh, now, you know, you've seen all, probably seen all the pictures online, but there were a lot of big games. Uh, the poor Clash of Arms, got the Labate uh, guys, uh, just <laughs> poor guys. They got three hours of game time done in three days, uh, I think due to some very tentative play from some of the guys so that seemed to be pretty frustrating for them although they enjoyed what they did was the feedback I got from the, the, the two more aggressive players they were hopeful that they would have got more done I looked at the maps and everything beautiful counters and all the rest of it but it seems to me that the majority of the counters end up face down and uh, with all the you know the digits that you need on the back for melee and shooting and this and that and morale and all that sort of stuff so kind of took away from the grand beauty of the game uh, but still curious about that system uh, we'll see I don't think I have the ASL style brain for, for that game Battle for Normandy they crank through a great scenario doing the landings and try to cut off Calais and all that sort of stuff the guys there had a lot of fun Here I Stand was played and uh, Dune was played and uh, there was some Axis and Allies, there was a big uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 guys playing the uh, ASL tournament. Uh, so a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of games out for display as well. Uh, I'll be writing a little bit about those rather than trying to talk about them now, but there were several games out. There one that I had not seen before called If Only, or What If, or something like that, uh, by this guy by the name of Jeffrey Phipps. Uh, he's an Australian guy, and it's a... a uh, a look at the Dardanelles campaign from World War One, and the, land, the landings there and, and what could have been done differently. So really interested in seeing that uh, get through its playtest cycle and, you know, maybe go to a publisher or a Kickstarter or something this year. That'd be really cool. I think that's all I got for you. Uh, this week, next week, I'm looking at trying to play the Case Blue scenario from the Dark Valley. You know, this little guy. And um, see how that goes. Uh, I'm just looking at the moment. It seems to be an awful lot of counters for the Soviets. Uh, I've got my case blue, uh, my big case blue game set up still, and uh, I'm going to go to a, a game auction this weekend and see if I can pick up some cheap titles. Oh yeah. So uh, speaking of cheap titles, I picked Gazala up the SCS title. Uh, unpunched. It's only in the baggie, but ten bucks. Not a bad deal. I'm kind of excited about that. I don't know what I was thinking, but hey, you know, I need another multiplayer game. Like, I need a hole in the head, but I picked up China, the Middle Kingdom. And uh, Decision Games title, four players. Should work out great. That's going to be great. 
I'm not sure why I bought it, but I um, probably have some plan. And then, uh, how can I not buy this game with this amazing square jawed, epic, uh, iconic art? Look at that jaw. Look at that jawline. This is Panzer Command. It's a company level treatment of combat in the East Front. Complexity high. Solitaire suitability high. And it's from, uh, I think it's from Victory Games. Yeah, it's a Victory Games title. I'm really liking Victory, Tank, Victory Games uh, products, so I figured I must just get it. And that was uh, fairly inexpensive as well. It's still in the shrink. It's in great shape. I brought it off Ralph Shelton. Uh, got to have a look at the new uh, Blood and Roses game as well. That looks awesome. I was talking to Ralph a lot about that a lot. In fact, Ralph and I spent a lot of time chatting uh, just about different games and different systems and different designers and their approaches to things and spent some time with Mark Simonich as well which was very cool and uh, got to know him a little bit better and I think it was Mike Roche, Roush who has the uh, 1914 title that uh, French name for a World War I game that was there, that was being played uh, I have helped to pack that up and watched eagerly as they uh, shoved counters around in World War I style uh, so you know, it was just very, very entertaining. I had a really good time, and I appreciate all the work that uh, Jeff Newell and the guys, uh, Peter Gade and Ralph, put into uh, hosting everybody. And I'm glad that I could participate. And that is probably way too much, and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.